when when did baseball and basketball really start to mean in your free time? I want to be out there on the field or I want to be on the court. Was it seventh grade, ninth grade, eleventh grade? When was it start to really be your focus? At the age of seven. That young? Yeah. At the age of seven. And I had a lot of help from my parents who pushed me. Uh, my brothers pushed me, my older brothers, because they could see some talent. I'm going to give you something that's going to really blow your mind. In the first grade, I was a starting point guard for the high school team. In first grade? In basketball. How big were okay. you? Now you've heard of Shoeless Joe Jackson in baseball. I was Shoeless Ray Burris in basketball from the state of Oklahoma. I was seven years old. And this is how they taught me how to dribble the basketball. We would take garden gloves right. and put on our hands so we could feel the ball, not, not sure, the dribbling with the palm, sure. dribbling with the, with the meat of your hands. Yeah. That's how they taught me. And I could dribble. Oh, I could dribble. By the, by the time where you were in high school, did you have a favorite team, a favorite player, you know, newspapers, no. radio? Well, when I got to high school, I, I just enjoyed other sports. Okay. I enjoyed the, 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 comp the competition in the trenches. Like in basketball, I enjoyed the competition with the big man in the paint. Sure. In football, I enjoyed the linemen and the defensive line. Really? You know, okay. Because that's where the action is yeah. at. They paved the way for whatever ha happened oh, behind absolutely. them. Yeah. So that always intrigued me. Even today, when I sit and watch basketball, yeah. I'd rather watch high school or college basketball yeah. than pro basketball. When you're in high school, um, somebody's got to be watching you play for, for you to be drafted as a catcher and then also be looked at in college. Did you feel pressure in your junior, senior year? Um, the other kids on the team are like, Ray, there's scouts here. Uh, we, we weren't pretty with that. We, we didn't. We played for the love of the game. I didn't know there were scouts in the stands. I had no idea. I had no idea that were scouts in the game. Uh, I didn't realize scouts were in the stands until I got to college. Okay. When when you graduate from high school, how big was your graduating class? Is it a real big class, a big school, or is it small? I was in the top 12% of my class, academically. Did you know that? <laughs> no. <laughs> you never knew that. I, I didn't know. know. <laughs> I've known this guy a long time, but I'm learning Now, today. the thing about it, I was in the top 12% of my class because we only had 12 people in the <laughs> senior class. <laughs> So I tell people, I'm in the top 12% of my class. We had nine men and three women in my graduating class. When we took our senior trip to Lake Eufaula in southeastern Oklahoma, we took two cars. That was, that was the senior class trip? That was the senior <laughs> class trip for a whole week. We, um, it's a fair question to ask. Were you an okay, you like history, were you an okay student? Were you 50 I was, 50? A, I was on the Dean's Honor Roll. You did well. And I, and, well, here's what propelled me to do well. My freshman year, I went to college and I partied and I flunked American government, not American government, American history, which is something I love. I sure. flunked American history. Now, here's what that did to me. Now, I don't know what it does to everybody else, but I thought about all of those days my mom walked five miles, ten miles to clean a house to put food on the table and here I was having an opportunity to better myself and I'm slacking and that did something to me. And I got busy in the classroom. I went to class, even though the professor said, you don't have to come to class. No, I'm coming to class. And I went from, uh, I got that A, that F off my report card and finished the next three years in college and doing a 3.65 GPA. Still have my transcript. Impressive. And, and I framed it. Um, <clears throat> you, end up, you end up going in the draft. You proved yourself through the minor leagues. But you came along a time that there was some serious people still in the game. One, um, Hank Aaron, man. Uh, you literally were in one dugout when Hank Aaron was in the other dugout making baseball history, dealing with hatred and hate mail, but still focusing on the game. Um, did you ever face him? Memories of Hank? Thoughts on Hank? Faced him many times. Really? Faced him many times. His last Grand Slam in the big leagues was off of me, so I never forgot that in Atlanta, Fulton County Stadium. 3-2 pitch, fastball on the outside part of the plate, straight away center field. Live it today and every day in my mind, I can still see the pitch sequence. Face they away. say, they say, you know, when I talk to guys like you, had the quickest wrists of any, any, uh, and, and you here, saw him at the end was, of his career. Here was an interesting fact about Hank Aaron. Most hitters, you have guest hitters who sit on a certain pitch. And if they get it, they're going to hit it good. Then you have hitters that just react to the ball, okay? Hank Aaron sit on a breaking ball. Now you don't teach that. You don't teach hitters to sit on a breaking ball. 
And I asked him one day, I said, hey, I said, uh, how come you how come you sit on a breaker ball? He said, because I know can't nobody throw a fastball by me. Truth is truth. The man had the quickest hands. I mean, I saw him, it looked like he just took it out of the catcher's mitt. Boom. Flipped it. Flipped it. Just this. Flipped it. A hundred and some wins. What what are one or two that, you know, stand out or special to you? You know, that's a lot the, of wins. The the, the, the first one. That's the first uh, one. Relive it. Home or away? I was in uh, Shea Stadium, old Shea Stadium. Uh, this was 1973. Bill Pappas had uh, some family situations he had to fly back to Chicago to deal with. And uh, I got the spot start in, uh, in Shea Stadium. And uh, facing uh, uh, Jerry Kuzman. Scared to death, shaking my knees, just shaking like it was going out of style. And uh, I go five innings. I go into the bottom of the fifth inning, walk the first three guys I faced. Really? Walk the first three guys I faced. I got a one nothing lead at that time. And proceed to strike out the next three guys. And <laughs> Jack Aker comes in and goes Jack four Aker. innings to get the save and you, you get the win. You give him a hug? You, you, oh, I gave him a big hug. <laughs> he bought him a beer. <laughs> First W in the big league. Yeah. Uh, Jack Aker throws four innings. And uh, this young kid from Oklahoma gets his first W. You buy him a beer, right? Now you're in the locker room sitting in front of that locker, right? It, it works done for the day. But that that is a dream, literally, of A, putting the uniform on, B, being in the dugout, but C, getting your first hit or your first W. And you got it. Um, the rest of that day, that night, the next morning, family, phone calls, what? Uh, you got it. Well, I called my mom. Uh, and my mom was really an avid fan uh, of sports because she played basketball in high school. Okay. And uh, uh, so I call her uh, and uh, relive that moment with her. Uh, I still have the uh, uh, the box score. Really? Uh, got the lineup card, uh, all that frame. That my first one. Uh, my second milestone for me was my 50th win. Okay. In the big leagues. And uh, describe, the reason I say my 50th because you know, earlier I was talking about the goal was to get four years in the big leagues. Sure. Now, 50 wins in the big league wasn't even on my mind because I'm thinking I'm going, I'm a bullpenner, a bull sure. reliever when I got up to the big leagues, even though I started in the minor leagues because that's the way the system works. Um, so now I'm in the rotation uh, in 1975. And then I go on and have some pretty good years. Three in a row. Three man. in a row after that. And, uh, and, and the, the tail end, the beginning of free agency was just starting to build up. So I got a little taste of the old and I got a little taste of the new. Sure. Um, then my third milestone was my 100th. Well, go back to the 50th win. <clears throat> home away? Do you remember some It was at home. It was at yeah. home. It was against the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. That means Luke Rock was in the lineup. Yeah. Joe Torre might have been in the lineup. Uh, Joe Torre was in the yeah. lineup. I mean, he won a batting crown. Some folks forget yeah. that Joe Torre was yeah. the batting leader. Playing third base. Uh, just because uh, we said Luke Rock. Luke Rock's on first base, right? 99 out of 100 guys can be on first base. That's Luke Rock on first base with you in the mound. Uh, I, I can't talk about this with anybody else. What, what, what are you doing with Luke Rock on first base? I mean, the man's the best in the world. Well, the whole concept is trying not to let him get to first base. <laughs> <That problem. laughs> but he also got over 3,000 hits. He got over 3,000 hits. But, <laughs> and he got some off of me, too. But the, the thing with Lou Brock was to vary your moves. You know, at that time, you really was taught to vary your moves. What I mean by that is when I come set, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, go to first. Right. Come set again, 1,001, go home. So I'm varying my times. That's yeah. how you had to affect Lou Brock's rhythm sure. and tempo. Because Lou Brock, believe it or not, when he first got to the big leagues, he had the speed, but he didn't know how to excel on the first two steps. Okay. So his way of, of understanding that, he went to, uh, during the offseason, he would go and work out with track and field guys, and they would beat him in the 100-yard dash. Okay. He couldn't understand how they was getting so far ahead of him so quick. We made it tough on him. Because all my job as a pitcher is to give my catcher a chance to throw him out. If I can get him started late and not get a good jump, that matter of inches 
makes a difference between a stolen base and a thrown out Absolutely. base runner. So uh, in that game, I think I went seven innings. I won the game five to three. He had one stolen base. And then my 100th victory was in the American what, what, League. What team were you with? Yeah, go ahead. And my 100th victory was with uh, uh, Milwaukee Brewers. Really? I beat the White Sox in Comiskey, old Comiskey Park. Uh -uh. So. Well, you would put in your time, uh, you know, to still be around to get that 100th win. Uh, memories of that game? Uh, I'll take what I can get from you. Memories of that game was a, was a tough mental battle for me, for some reason, that game. I knew it was. I was going for number one hundred, and the the thing. Here's what a lot of people don't understand in the game of sports: the mental energy you exert during the course of a competitive event. Sure. Let alone the physical. Sure. Okay, you can be tired physically, but when you have a mental exhaustion on top of the physical, that is the worst tiredness in the world after that game because I was focusing so much on that ball on, on every pitch I couldn't even take a fork <laughs> with food in it to my mouth you had it Un unbelievable you had to decompress I had to I had to totally decompress I go home I go to the hotel I'm laying in the bed my phone rings and I'm laying, my phone is to my right. I'm laying on my back, and I go to reach, and that's as far as I got. Really? I got cramps in both hamstrings, both quads, both arms. For 20 minutes, I couldn't even move. I was like suspended in animation. It was a good night's sleep. Once I got to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just total exhaustion. That, and, I, and that was that was about the 10th time I had had that because that was the kind of athlete I was when I played it's an example that you you left nothing out there. Well, there's no reason to leave nothing out there. You take it, you take it out there, and you leave it out there. And when you walk off that mound, you ain't got nothing left, and you know you competed to the best of your ability, and that's all you can give yourself. You know, I try to tell these young men today, you know, don't hold back. What is it to hold back? I don't know if I'm going to even be on this earth tomorrow. Sure. Where's the guarantees? Can somebody guarantee I'm gonna wake up in the morning? Absolutely I not. For, for baseball fans, especially uh, Montreal Expo fans, for uh, a long time there was no team in Washington, D.C., and these fans would work and work and work to try to get baseball back to Washington. Uh, the Montreal Expo team that you were a part of was an unbelievable group of talent. I um, And we, we can go right. You, you get, first of all, you start with two Hall of Famers. You got Carter catching you. And you got Dawson backing you up, running all over the place, and representing the home plate. Um, it was an unbelievable group of talent put together. So the Expo, somebody scouted, somebody was doing their job because you well, came in to do your thing in Montreal. Here's what happened. After the 80 season, I got traded in, in August of 79 to the Mets uh, after Thurman Munson got killed. Um, I spent a year and a half with the Mets. Joe Torrey was the manager. After the 80 season, I was called in by the general manager who told me he couldn't afford me. So I became a free agent. And in the free agency, I had three teams that was interested in me. Texas Rangers, Expos, uh, and the Oakland A's. Let me stop you there because that's what the fans actually like. Now it's you, your agent, your brain, thinking, I've got these three teams interested. I didn't have an agent. I was you were, my agent. You were your own agent. Absolutely. In the 70s, you were your own agent? Absolutely. Going into the 80s, Absolutely. you were your own agent? I why, know. why would I need to pay somebody to go in and I, ask for <laughs> $2 million when I can do it on my own lips? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know. I why did you, why, besides money, all right, yeah. why did you pick the team that you picked out of the three that were interested? Because they were one to sit down and negotiate with me on the contract. I, I signed a contract with them. Three uh, years? In nine, no, no, no. One yeah. year. Uh, in 19, in February 18th of 1980, and went to spring training with the Expos in West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, 1981 was the year of the strike. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, it was February 18th, 81, when I signed with the Expo. Um, we go out on a strike in June, and they decide during that strike of 59 days that they were going to cut the seasons in half. So when the strike ended, when the strike occurred, 
the Philadelphia Phillies were leading our division. Oh, I got you. So yes. now the second half, the winner of that would go against the winner of the first half. I follow you. We won the second half. And uh, we go up against the Phillies, beat the Phillies. And while we were beating the Phillies, the Dodgers were beating the Houston Astros. And that was the year of Fernando Valenzuela Absolutely. mania. So we go up against the Dodgers in the, in the National League Championship Series and come one game of going to the World